church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe Jesus is God. We're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. We believe that prayer moves the hand of God, and it's normal for every believer to be intimate with God and devoted to His cause. At our church, we believe the Bible is God's Word. It's real, it's living, and it's active. We believe freedom is the heart of God for every believer, and we value humor, simplicity, teamwork, and a positive outlook on life. At our church, we're about developing great relationships with God, each other, and those in our community. At our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and will not water down or candy coat that message, ever. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we're not concerned about where you've been, but where you're going. We believe that all people matter to God, and therefore matter to us. Today, you have chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially life-changing message. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our church. church. I've not seen a lot of them manifest in my life and in other people's lives that I love. And, you know, and I'm like, why is that, Lord? And I was going to preach on something else today, but I felt like God showed me something. Actually, I started this week thinking about Roxanne asked me to preach, and I thought about all week what I was going to preach on. Last night I sat down, yesterday afternoon, sat down, kind of go through the Bible and do my sermon. It just wouldn't come to me, but I thought I wanted to preach about. It just I did this didn't fall in place, it didn't come together, there was no scripture. Usually when I make a scripture up, I don't start with one scripture and then God reveals in my head and remembers another scripture that ties in with it. You know, the Bible is just like a picture puzzle. It all ties together and it's perfect and it mm -hmm. supports each other. And the scripture reveals scripture. The more we look at it, the more we see. It says this here and it says that there. And, you know, and it just all comes together and it ties together and fits perfectly. But when I was trying to make up my sermon, that wouldn't happen. Finally, about 10.30, I was so tired and sleepy. I said, you know what, God, I believe you have a message you want me to talk about, but I'm going to bed because I will do it in the morning. So this morning at 5 o'clock, the dog wanted out. <laughs> Get up and let the dog out. The cat wants to bed, you know, and all these different things. Because that's when we usually get up, and they don't know that today's the Lord's Day, that we're supposed to sleep in a little bit and relax and everything. There's... But anyway... <clears throat> Talked about uh, we fail to enter God's rest. You know, that's a thing that talks about Hebrews. And most people think that that's heaven, God's rest. But he was showing me today, he says, I told you, you've already passed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light when you received me as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Why are you still struggling? Why are you still thinking that somehow you're in charge? <laughs> you know, it says that we're to be at rest with him. And all this stuff going on around us, we're like, what in the world? You know, how's, and we know how it's all going to end. I shouldn't say how it's going to end, but you know, we look at it. And things going on in my family, you know, and stuff. I mean, my daughter, living with a guy that she's not married to. You know, I begged her not to leave when she left. She said, I'm an adult, I can do what I want. And you know that's right. I think back about it, I think, you know, much as I hate to say it, that girl reminds me a whole lot of myself. <laughs> How can I be mad at her? You know? I'm not mad at her, I love her. But I do have the promise of God, he said. I have to promise my children for a thousand generations and I'm standing on the word. I'm not worried about it. He's got her out there. There's some things she's got to learn the hard way and she's got to come to him with a broken spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You know, that's what I realized when he was talking about being in peace, being at rest. I want to read to you Hebrews. I'm going to start at the Hebrews 3, 16 and read the 4, 2 to start out with. For who having heard rebelled, indeed was not all of was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for forty years when 
Was it not those who had sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering into rest, his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed, indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So it says that we're to enter a rest. The children of God are to enter a rest. And yet I see Christians, or people that call themselves Christians, that's between them and God. I mean, I can't judge them. But they're just going here and there like they look like ants on a hot rock just running around. You know, they can't stop. They just go, 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 go. They can't rest. And they're trying to do all these different things. Some of them please God, some of them do get what they have desires for, you know, so many different, like I say, so many different things, and they're just, you know, I see them with their kids especially. I have three or four kids, and each kid's involved in two or three things at school, and those people are on the go 24-7. And anymore, they don't care if it's Sunday, they have ball games on Sunday, you know, Little League and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they just go, 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 and I think, what in the world? How can they be happy? And yet it says that these people in the wilderness didn't enter into God's rest. And it says it was because they didn't obey. I thought, wait, what about the message of what about the message of hyper grace, you know, that we hear now? That's all about what Jesus did. You don't have to do anything. It's about what Jesus did that you enter into, you know, the heavens and into heaven and everything. And there is truth to that. However, let me tell you this, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but faith produces obedience. When you believe what the Word says, truly get it in your heart, you will do your best to obey it. And the reason is, is because when you understand, God wants the best for us. God doesn't want to see us hurt. It's like my daughter and I. I want the best for my daughter. That's why I said, please don't go. I don't think this is a good move on your part. I think this is going to come back to hurt you. You know, God can't bless disobedience. But what I realize is, you know, we can't build on previous generations. We all have to learn for ourselves. And it's an individual thing between us and God. Nobody can make us do it. Nobody can tell us how to do it. It's something that, and that's why God has allowed us, given us that free will. So, you know, it says that there is disobedience. If you read on, though, it says they couldn't enter his rest, those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. So truly, if they had really believed God, they would have obeyed. But because they didn't believe, you know, if I tell you this building falling down and you believe it, you're going to head for the door. But unfortunately, most of us have to see something before we believe it. Don't let the Bible say we walk by faith, not by sight. They act easy. They said, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, do a miracle so that we might believe. He said, even if you see a miracle, you won't believe. You know, I think about some of the miracles I've seen in my lifetime. And I think, you know, they had x-rays that showed that lump on their liver from two days ago. And today, when they went in to do the surgery, they took another x-ray and it's like, what heck? Well, our x-ray machine must have messed up. This must have been somebody else's x-ray. You know, things like that just don't happen. That's not explainable. It's explainable. God's a healer. Amen. He can do all things, and sometimes he doesn't. I don't know why sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't, but I do know that nothing's too hard for God. Amen. Amen. That's right. So, you know, he lets us <clears throat> pick and choose. I got tickled to one of the guys I work for. He claims to be agnostic. I'm not sure if that's just, it's just a different word for an unbeliever, really. I mean, it's Try to make it sound a little different, but truthfully, it's... If you don't believe in God, you're not a believer. Either you do or you don't. You can call it whatever you want. Put whatever name you want. 
one of our refrigerators was going in for a common appointment that we both love and going in for open heart surgery. And I was sitting there telling him about it. He said, well, all we can do is pray. And I'm like, wait a minute. You told me he's agnostic. I, I didn't say that to him, but my mind said, the Lord can do it. You know, he knows. He knows. He can't deny it forever. All the world knows. They just want to deny it so they don't have to be obedient. Uh -huh. They want to do what they want to do. They don't want to do what God's called them to do. Let's read on a little farther. Hebrews 4, verses 8 through 13. Uh, or Hebrews 3, through 7. Uh, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said I swore in my wrath, in my wrath they shall not enter my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way and God rested on the seventh day from all his works and again in this place they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains that some must enter it and those whom it first was preached who did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it, been, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, you know, it talks about their disobedience once again and the hardening of their hearts. When I think about that, one thing Roxanne has always kind of written me about, because a lot of times when I get up here and get to preaching, I need some Kleenexes, because I get pretty shook up. And I do think it's all about our hearts. Yeah. When we have love for each other, when we see others going through struggle, and it you know, tears at us. For God so loved the world. And, you know, it's no longer I that live with in chapter 2, verse 20. It says, it's no longer I that live with Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live according to him. You know, he sees our hearts. And it's because of that unbelief or that casting out of the believing. I, I really think that almost everybody truly believes. But I think because of their lack of willingness to obey, they say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And the reason I believe that is because that was me for a lot of years. See, if you guys had known me up until the time I was in my 40s, you wouldn't have never thought I'd be here today. <laughs> That's a lot of sarcasm. <laughs> Amen, but you know, God loves us. He has patience with us. Thanks. We're to have patience with each other. Because, mm -hmm. see, I used to hit the bars pretty hard. Don't know that I've never an alcoholic. I never had trouble giving up drinking. But, I had several relationships with women. I was an adulterer for sure. Uh, you know, his divorce, that wasn't a good thing. I mean, like I said, it wasn't my fault, but part of it was. I wasn't home where I needed to show up in. I didn't have the love of God in my heart to forgive other people when they make mistakes. You know, time to get rid of them if they fucked up. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. Yeah. And God allowed it. He was just waiting to see how long it would take me to realize that yeah. what I wanted to do was not fulfilling. Yeah. 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 And I think about that and I think, well, you know, I always believe in God. I don't think there was ever a time I didn't believe in God. But I didn't believe enough to realize, or to, I didn't understand enough maybe to realize that.
because I didn't follow him and didn't do according to his word and didn't do my best to do what he said, that it was killing me. And those that I loved around me too. But I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And that's what was important to me. I worked hard, have a nice car, a nice house, put on a good show for everybody. And I was there in the bar with the buddies, you know. We were having a good time. I'm going to tell you what, I look back on it now, and I feel sorry for some of the guys I work with. But, you know, it seems to be, and I think, was I that way, and I must have been. It seems to be like they must. They feel like they can't have a good time without a little alcohol or drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go have a good time. Yeah. Tip one up. Maybe, well, you never tip one up. <laughs> <laughs> you tip one up to start with, and then one after that, one after that, one after that, because you can't hardly see straight to get home. And I spent many a night and woke up in the bar the next morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, God knows our heart. We have to get it in our heart and believe it in our heart. The Bible says we judge according to our hearts. Huh. We have to get it down deep. That's why we're not receiving a lot of the things that God promised us, but we're not really truly believing that He has our best interest at heart. That he's telling us, you know, my kids, when I used to tell them things all the time, I don't want you home by 11 o'clock. I don't want you running around with that kid. Or we've been in our jail three times. Don't need you going there with me. I told them things like that, not because I wanted to be bossy. If I thought they knew that on their own, I would have said, hey, go have a good time. And they probably did know it on their own, but I wanted them to know that it wasn't all right with me if they did that. Or if they were out after that. Because I cared about them. I loved them. I didn't want them getting hurt. I didn't want them getting into trouble. See, that's why God mm -hmm. Amen. gives yeah. us yeah. commandments. Yes, he does. You know, I, I, I see a lot of people that are church people. They say, oh, I love Jesus. I'm not the judge. I don't know their heart. The Bible says who can know it. But I'm like, well, your actions sure don't show it because the Bible says if you love Jesus, you obey his commandments. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Wait a minute. I thought I had hyper grace and I could do anything I want. Jesus paid my sin and I can, you know, depend on him to save me. It doesn't say that. It does say that without faith we can't please God. But when we have faith, we will obey his word and we will do what he says. So let's read on here. I want to get down a little further. Verse 8 and started at the, verse 9. Uh, for, I guess verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, they would not have afterwards spoken of another day. Therefore it remained a rest for the people of God. Therefore, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seek from his works as God did from his. People read that and say, oh, so we're not supposed to work. Is that what that means? We're let God take care of us. We just lay on the couch. God's going to take care of us. I want to ask you a question. Maybe, maybe some of you don't know. I, I wouldn't know about this, but is golf work? I mean, I've never really played golf. My boy played golf in high school, and all I can remember trying to hit that ball on the tee. And, it went about three feet there, and it went over there, and it went over there. Sometimes I just totally missed it, you know. But to me, I used to love to hunt. And I can tell you what, I spent hours hunting. I loved to go, but you know, I was wore out more when I came home from hunting than I was when I came home from work. Yeah. I told my boss one day it was raining, and he told us to go out and do something. I said, my union card, and we didn't have a union there, I was just harassing. My union card says I can't work in the rain. He said, well, you go hunting in the rain. I said, I want to go hunting. I don't want to go hunting. <laughs> See, 
I don't think that it means that we don't do anything. It just means that it ceases to be work, something that we have to do. You know, the Bible never says to work for your living. It says work that we might have something to give when somebody has a need. But God says he's the provider. That's right. He's the provider. You know what? I could go out and work myself silly. I can win the lottery, you know, and maybe have five million dollars. But you know, most of the people win the lottery within five years of growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're more miserable than they've ever been in their whole life. And yet, that's the very thing that they thought would make them happy. See, God can take just a teeny bit and make it go a long ways, or He can take a whole bunch and just dump it right down the drain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it says he ceased from his work, I don't think God just quit doing anything. He just quit doing things that maybe he didn't want to do. Or maybe he felt like he had to do. Had to get something done. See, I go to work every day. And a lot of days, when I really think about it, and know it, I know I'm going to work so I can minister to the guys I work with. It's my ability to go minister to them. And some of them don't want to hear it. And I don't throw the pearls before the swine because they don't want to hear it. I just go ahead and try to live the best life I can in front of them from how a Christian man is supposed to live. Be honest and work hard. Care about each other. Even though maybe they don't care too much about me. They, just, they throw me under the bus. But that's okay. That's who they are. That's who I used to be. How could I be mad at them? That's where I came from. So... When I think about ceasing from the work, I don't think it means that we cease from doing things. I just think it means that we understand it's no longer work. It is now what I want to do, what I desire to do. And there are days, I will tell you, there are days when it's still work. I'm still, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still struggling with that. But you know, I get to go minister to those people. One of the guys I work with, just tell you a little bit, he's going through some health issues, and he's younger than I am. And some things that, you know, really surprised me. When I told him, I said, and he's a pretty gruff guy, you know. He told me one day, he says, his dad's a minister. My dad told me, you shouldn't ought to be doing that. Hey, 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 hey. Getting on him and pointing his finger at him. So I told him, I said, Dad, when you're pointing that finger at me, there's three pointing back at you. I told him, I said, you know what? Your dad's just doing that because he loves you. He may not be going around the right to tell you how he loves you or why or anything else, but he's just doing that because he loves you. And he looked at me and I thought he was going to come to tears. I know it. I said, what? You're ecstatic. He's just doing it because he loves you. Yeah, maybe he doesn't know how to tell you that he loves you or that he cares about you. But this guy's going through some health issues. And I told him, I said, pray for you. He said, please do. I mean it. He said, and then one day he texted me. He said, keep praying for me. He said, I think God listens to you. And I texted him back. He said, he does listen to me, but he listens to you too. You need to be praying to you. So he's been telling me he's praying. I texted him last night and had a little, it looks like a postcard, you know, how the Christmas time, you know, it's got a little candle in it and it says, uh, uh, it says, uh, may the peace of God be with you. He's having trouble sleeping. Not getting more than about an hour or two of sleep at night. He's just wore out, you know, they still coming to work and everything, so they can't sleep. They need some money. And it says, may, may you have sweet dreams, may the peace of God be with you and everything. And he texted me back and he said, I thank you for that because that's what I need, some sleep and some sweet dreams. And I said, God will give them to you. I said, you know, the Bible says what Satan meant for evil, God will turn around and make it for good. I said, I don't know how he's going to do it. And I don't know why he's doing it. But I said, I do believe if we have faith in his word that whatever you're going through is going to be turned around for your good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now maybe it's just bringing him to God. I don't know. Maybe this guy has never confessed Jesus as his Savior. I know he believes in him, but I don't know that he's confessed it. That he's given his life to the Lord. Maybe he's going through these things because I don't know. Maybe he's just 
bringing him to this point so that he will walk with a closer walk with God too. I don't know. But I do believe what Satan meant for evil, God's going to turn it around and use it for good. So we have to understand that as we walk daily, it's no longer work. God's my redeemer. God's my healer. God's my provider. God's my Jesus in my life. Amen. Amen. I don't have anything without Him. Amen. I can walk through this world and accumulate lots, but if I don't have Him, I don't have anything. I don't know if any of you have seen it. There's a minister now that I think he's got a book out called Denmark. But that's what he said. They asked me, what are you going to do? So I got to ask young kids, what are you going to do? Oh, when I get big, I'm going to get a college education. I'm going to do this. He said, then what? Oh, I'm going to get married and have three kids. And, you know, I'm going to have a big house and a Maserati or whatever. Then what? Well, and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Then what? Oh, I'm going to retire and I'm going to play golf most of the day. And, you know, I'm going to do this. Then what? He said, because it all ultimately comes to, well, then I guess I'm going to get old and die. Then what? Then what? I thought it was going to get old by some of us die young, but you know that being said. Then what? Then what? So, I want to read on, you know, but like I said, it said he ceased from his works. Well, I want to tell you, the things we do for God should not be work. They should not be work. They ought to be fun. They ought to be joyous. We ought to be rejoicing that God allows us to work for Him and to do good things for Him. You know, the Bible says, do not get tired of doing good. For in the end, you shall reap. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest as anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us come therefore boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a couple of things I want to point out there. It says, uh, therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest. Well, you know, we've got to be obedient, the Bible says, to his word. You know, I think about all the things that are going on in Richard. He spoke to me powerfully when he, when he preached, he talked about, about the schools and why all the violence and the things that are going on in the school and how they tossed out the commandments and they tossed out prayer and they tossed out the Bible, basically tossed God out of the, out of the mm -hmm. schools and Satan runs most of them. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, we need to follow God, that follow after God and do His will, do His commands. And you know, people say, well, you're preaching, you're preaching, uh, how they say, legalism. Legalism, not grace. You're preaching legalism. You don't enter into the kingdom of God by obeying the commands. You're imperfect. You can't do it. You will never be able to do it. The Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. The flesh can't please God, it says. The only way we're pleasing to God is our faith in Him and who He says He is. So, you know, the Bible says that Enoch was taken up and did not see death. You know why he was taken up and did not see death? The Bible says it's because he had a testimony. He testified that he was pleasing to God. Not that God was pleased with him, but that he was pleasing to God. He believed God and God said, I love you. You're my son. I never leave you or forsake you. See, 
We have to have faith in His Word. And that will bring us into obedience. And yet, like I say, we we say we believe, but yet we go out and do whatever we want. And, and that, that brings us back to, you know, God allowed it. But He knows our hearts. How many of you, when you... How many of you say prayers every morning? Yeah? Everybody. Everybody ought to be saying prayers every morning, every night, every every evening. Yeah. You know, the Muslims say, oh, we pray seven times a day. I say, well, that's pretty good. I pray all day. Because I know who's in charge whenever I have a problem. But when you pray, you say, Holy Spirit, take control of me. Use me, guide me, direct me. Put my lust, my desires to death and make me alive in the Spirit, following God, doing what God wants. Show me what God wants. Give me the strength to do what God wants. Because a lot of times, this old flesh ain't going to want to do what God wants. It wants what I want. I got to tell you something. I don't know if I should tell you this or not. You know that you know that you're working hard to follow God and obey the Spirit and to give the Spirit control when He corrects you in a dream. Yeah. I got to tell you something happened there. I told I woke up the other morning. I told my wife, I "said I had a dream. I don't know if I should tell you this or not." Because <laughs> I don't know if you'd be mad at me or not. I said, "I think you shouldn't be, but there, you know, I know how one more. Maybe you will be." We've been, I've been downloading some music from back when I was in high school. Or not downloading it, but listening to it on, online, you know, the night before. Some old songs I knew from high school and stuff. For whatever reason, that night I dreamed. That's back in high school. I was sitting in the school cafeteria. I don't know if we had convocation or why we were there. We didn't really get a choice where we sit. So the little girl sitting beside me, she was kind of cute. I mean, I, it wasn't anybody I remember from school, but she was cute. I mean, she wasn't kind of cute. She was cute. <laughs> <laughs> she reached over and put her hand on my knee, and I just kind of reached out and took her hand on my hand. You know, you know how school kids do. Especially when they're young. I say, I, I don't know why I dreamed this dream, but it wasn't something that God, what I would have thought God had had me dream. But anyway, I thought she was cute. And at lunchtime in our school, they let us go in the gym and go outside if the weather was nice and everything. And I feel like I can tell this since this one's all dogs. <laughs> I went outside and this girl came over to me and she gave me a big hug and a kiss. Uh -huh. Well, I didn't bite her too much. <laughs> in the building up back to school, she grabbed hold of my hand and she said, come on, let's go make a hug. I said, no, I'm married. And she said, I don't care. And I said, but I do. <laughs> like, the Holy Spirit has control, even in my dreams. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I told my wife, I said, I'm not sure why he wasn't in control when she was holding my hand or when she gave me a hug and a kiss. But she went too far at some point because I knew better than to do what she was wanting to do because I've been there and it's got me in a lot of trouble in the past. <laughs> Some of us are slow to learn, but we can't be taught. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, we know what the Word says a lot of it, but we need to know more about the promises. I'm not going to really have time to finish this, but I want you to, you know the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. Talks about the the uh, Gentiles, you know, they're looking for clothing, they're looking for food, they're looking for shelter, they're looking for all the things that they need in life. Yeah. I said, don't worry about that stuff. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And I think, how many of us do that? Do we really do that? Do we depend on God for everything? Do we... I've been thinking, you know, I'm going to be old enough to retire in another year. And I'd really like to retire so I can spend more time in the ministry. But then I think, but I really have a hard time living on what they want to pay me to retire in 62. Yeah. Thinking God.
no, show me a way. No, and that's, that's a possibility. So, I want to read you some scripture too out of Ephesians 3. Like I said, I really, really want to hustle to get through this, but Ephesians 3. Verse 1. But to thinking about entering into God's rest and why we don't enter into that rest, why we drive ourselves crazy trying to do all the things that we got to do that needs to be done. Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. It says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might to his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length, depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And what I want you to get out of that is we might know the love of Christ because I was sharing with uh, Brett before church, I said, you know, the thing I, I think most people really need to understand to come to Christ is how much he loves you. Amen. How much he loves you. Yes, he does. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Hey, you might turn your backs on him and you might do some things that you aren't supposed to, but what I realized looking back on my past life, he was with me all the time. Yes. And he wants the best for you, but he's given you the option. I think about why God created the earth and did everything he did and created Satan. God. God knew the end from the beginning. He knew what Satan was going to do. There was no doubt when he created him, he knew what Satan... The Bible says he created the destroyer to destroy. And you think, why would he create somebody as evil and wicked and cause as much pain and terror and just hideous things? Why would he create somebody? He wanted to give each and every one of us a choice. You know, he sowed his son into the earth so that he might bring a family from that earth, that he might have a family. He gave us each a choice. He wants a family that loves him just like he loves us. And I believe that's why he gave us this choice. <coughs> it's your choice where you spend eternity. I've heard one preacher say, it's not about whether you're going to live here forever, it's about where you're going to live forever. With God or without God. In goodness or in hell. To answer the question, why am I living that I started out with without seeing some of the promises made to me? Because I don't truly still have the total faith I need to have. And I don't be, oh, well, if you have the faith inside of a grain of mustard seed. Jesus told the people, he said, oh, ye of little faith. What does that mean? You haven't fully turned yourself over to him to understand how much he loves you and how much he'll be there. He wants the best for you. And you know what? A lot of times, the best for us is not what we consider the best for us. The Bible says that, you know, he'll give us all that we have need of. Well, sometimes we want way more than we have need of. Sometimes that way more abundance, like I was talking about family member that has a lot of things and has finances and everything, but you know, doesn't even take his own kids to church. And I know that he was a strong believer when he was younger. So a lot of times God withholds things because he knows we can't handle them. And then other times I think that God withholds things because he knows that we aren't truly believing for them. Like, See, I've often wondered why some people, when they pray for them, they get healed and some people don't. I 
They don't think the doctor pays for the person that's doing the treatment. I don't even think the doctor pays for the person that's asking for healing. I think sometimes it brings us to a different state of mind and we realize that this life's not all that important. This body's passing away. It's temporary, the Bible says. The main thing is that we get it in our head, what's really important, and that is following God and doing what He's called us to do, to love Him and to love others. See, because death of this body, no, I'm not ready to go. Well, if it happens, it happens. It's inevitable unless Jesus comes first and calls us up to where the body just changed like that from corruptible to incorruptible and from mortal to immortal. But even then, it's not going to be the same body. See, we don't understand that. You know, we consider death as the end of everything. But that's all we can see. That's all we know. But it's not the end. It's truly just the beginning. Amen. And that's why sometimes they think, well, they didn't, they didn't get healed. Well, they may have been healed in many other ways. Their mind may have been renewed in the Lord because they had to live in that illness or sickness. Have you ever seen somebody that's dying and yet they're just full of you know, joy? Because God's given me another day. I can be with my family one more day. You know? They may even say, well, I, they're, they're dying. They say, well, I'm praying for my family that so-and-so will come to the board and so-and-so will come to the board. They don't have their mind on themselves. They understand you know, that we've put our mind on somebody. You ever think about that with Jesus? He didn't have his mind on himself. Forgive them, Father. They do not what they do. He said, you know, Lord, if there be any way for this cup to pass from me, so be it. Do it. But it's not my will, but your will be done. And I think. So, what I want to leave you with is when I say that we're not receiving some of the promises. And I think we're not. We're still not. But it is a progression to where we learn more and more and more of what God has for us. Because, truthfully, it's not about stuff, it's not even about life in this body. It's about my love and your love for each, for me, for each other, for the world. You know, God could have took us out today. We accepted Jesus, but He left us here to minister to others. Amen. That's why we're here. That's right. Amen. You know, it's not about our comfort. Apostle Paul wasn't very much comfortable. You know, he wasn't too comfortable in the jails and the meetings yeah. and all that he had. Yeah. But we should be celebrating what is coming, which is our eternal rest with the Lord. And we should be praising Him for this day and for every day that we have because He's waiting so that more might come to Him. That's Amen. why He's waiting. That's why He's not let the end of the world come yet. Amen. But there is a day coming. And I hope that all of you have received the Lord. If there's nobody, if there's somebody here that has never confessed Jesus, Pray that you would come up front after the meeting. We'll have a short prayer. We will confess Jesus. You know, the Bible says there's a celebration in heaven. Every time somebody comes to the Lord. Yeah. You know, for years I sit out there when the evangelist would come around. He'd get up there and stomp his foot. And he'd preach hellfire and you're going to hell if you don't accept the Lord. It's true. It wasn't nothing. He said it wasn't true. But I sat back there and hung on to my seat. I wouldn't go up there. I'd be embarrassed to go up there and put all them people. Don't ever be embarrassed. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for today. I pray that you will understand that God has many gifts for each one of us. We do receive them by holding fast to the promise. Amen. The promises that He's given us. Roxanne talked about the promises in Corinthians before the service. We hold fast to them and we confess them. We speak out to confess them. The Lord is my healer. Amen. The Lord is my redeemer. The Lord is my provider. I want you to think about two verses in comparison. Because this really kind of struck me today. I was thinking about a couple promises. Remember when Jesus told Caesar, Caesar said, Don't you understand? I can either have you crucified or I can set you free. Anybody remember what Jesus said back to him? Neither. 
if you don't have any power, then the Father gives it to you. You can't do anything unless the Father of us. Okay. What did Satan say to God in Job about? He'll turn around and curse you if you what? Take the hedge away and avow me. Take the hedge away and avow me. You understand that God's still in charge of everything. He is. Amen. That's hard to believe with all the turmoil going on on earth. He's allowing Satan to do these things. Yes, he is. In your life and in others. Mm -hmm. He is in control. Now take this verse, because this is a verse I confess a lot of times. Think about this in, com in comparison that Satan can't do anything unless God allows him. All things work to the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. That's why I was telling that guy, I don't know why Satan has put this evil upon you and done this to your body. But the Bible says what Satan meant for evil, God will turn around and use it for good. So when you're going through trials and tribulations and things that you wonder why you're going through, stand on that verse. I don't know why God is allowing this to happen. You know what happened to Job? Job said, I serve a good God. I will not curse him and die like my wife told me to do. I serve a good and loving God. I don't know why all this is happening to me. Job was blessed with twice everything he had before it all started. So when you're going through times of trial and trouble, never doubt that God still loves you. God's in control. What does he want you to get out of this trouble you're going through? And confess it. All things work to the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I love you, Lord. I'm accepting that promise. Diane, I'm thinking about you too when I say that. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. Mm -hmm. God has allowed Satan to test you for some reason. But I know when you come out the other side, the Bible says you will be purified like pure gold. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We, when we are tested and tried, the Bible says that we are strengthened and purified. I prayed to him before. Let's get this test over, God. I think I'm pure enough. I've had enough of this, but you know, don't forget his promises. And don't forget to confess them. Understand he loves you, and he's not going to let you down. Don't lose faith. Amen. Dear Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your great and mighty love. We thank you for Jesus. You sent him. To pay our sin debt in full. Because of that, because we believe it and confess it, we're going to spend eternity with him. Joint heirs, your word says. Thank you, Lord, for your great and mighty love. I pray that each one of these that goes out of here today will minister to others in the world. We'll tell them of your great and mighty love, and they'll tell them how you have helped them and the miracles you have done in their lives. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Shake a hand and.